Heavenly Father, now as we open your word, grant us the Holy Spirit to guide our minds. Give us understanding, we pray, in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. This morning we're talking on the three angels' messages. And those of you who've been here the last couple of Sabbaths know that we have been discussing uh, the angels mentioned in the book of Revelation. If you will turn there just now, Revelation, the 14th chapter, let me just touch on Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, where you find the first angel's message. Then we'll go to verse 8, where we find the second angel's message. And then this morning, we will, we will finish up with the third angel's message. Are you there? Revelation 14, and we're beginning there at verse 8. 6, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So the emphasis in number one, the first angel, is to get the gospel out. What is the gospel, beloved? The good news of what Jesus has done for us. Amen? The good news of what Jesus has done for us. Let's go to the second angel's message then. So the first angel said, this is the right thing to do. Second angel says, and there followed another angel, verse 8, saying, Babylon is fallen. Now, Babylon is first mentioned in Genesis, Genesis 10 and 11. There in Genesis, Babel, or Babylon, was a place where men were in defiance to God. Babylon represents man's way to heaven. And you pick, it's picked up from Genesis, it pick, the, the name Babylon is picked up into the book of Revelation, and in Revelation where it mentions Babylon, it's all false religions. All false religions. And it says, is fallen. Is fallen. Thus, beloved, man's way to heaven did not work in, the gen in Genesis, and it will not work in the end of the world. That's why Jesus says in Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. All right? Because that's the only mind that can be saved by the God of heaven. Now, the third angel's message. The third angel's message then comes to us. Verse 9. And the third angel followed, saying with a loud voice, that's a clear voice, understandable voice, because God's children, the world needs to understand what this message is, what the third message is particularly. First message, this is the right way. Second message, the man's way will fall. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man, what? Worship. Now, beloved, it's interesting to note this Final message, it particularly brings out the fact it's an issue of worship. Who are you going to worship? Huh? All right. And the third angel followed them with a, uh, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead, that's in the mind again, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath, which of God, which is poured out without mixture. Without mixture, no more mercy. It's all over. Time's up. There was a time in the world when the God of heaven sent his prophet Noah to preach and tell the world it's going to come to, to an end. And then the, they didn't believe Noah. They said he was crazy. Building a boat in the backyard. Never had rain before. And so... When the time came, God said, time's up, no more mercy. And the rain came down, and the floods came up, and there was no grace. Without mixture, that's what it means. Now notice verse 10. 10. The same shall drink of the wine of God, the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tor tormented, those who receive the wrath of God shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of, of the Lamb. 
and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, everlasting fire. We're going to comment on that. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast. Notice, who worship the beast. Why call this false religion beast? We're going to get into that. And they have no rest day or night. And they have no rest who worship the beast in his image and who receive his mark and in his, his and. Uh, the mark of his name. Here is patience of the saints. Here's a people who have waited on the God of heaven to follow him. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right? Thus, beloved, this is the marching orders of the Adventist church as I started off a couple of weeks ago. Worship. What does it mean to worship or worth-ship? Our word worship is derived from the old English word worth-ship. This shows us that true worship must be given to someone who merits worship, who is worthy of our worship. This is why graven images and idols are so abhorred by God. In Isaiah 46, verses 10 through, uh, 5 through 10, God says, who are you going to compare with me? Do you go out and, and carve a rock and put gold on it? Is that equal to me? That's what Isaiah is saying. Notice it, if you will. Now, beloved, the value is derived from the worth of the person or object. Worth-ship. Being worshipped. Revelation 4, let's answer that question. Revelation 4, turn there if you will, please. Revelation, the fourth chapter, reading at verses 10 and 11. Notice what it is said about Christ and his worthship. Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11. The four and twenty elders fell down before him, that sat on the throne, and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crown before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, worship, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? What makes him worthy? For thou hast created all things. Did you get it? For thou hast created all things, for and for thy pleasure... They are and were created. So the Bible says we are to worship him because he is worthy. And that which makes him worthy is that he has created how much? He's created all things. Go to chapter, the fifth chapter, looking at verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. And they sang or they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. This is the history of God's church. He could see both ways. He could see the future. He knew the past. Notice, so he's worthy to open the book. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, by thy blood, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings Kings to rule, priests to offer gifts. Kings to rule. What has he given us to rule over? Go to Romans, the 12th chapter. Hurry, don't slow me down, church. Romans, the 12th chapter. What has God given us to be kings of? Romans 12, starting at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies uh, of God, that ye present your what? Bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's only reasonable, it's only sensible to give yourselves to the God of heaven. He's created all things, he can sustain all things, and he offers us eternal life. All right? So the God of heaven, verse 10, has made us unto our God kings and and priests, and we shall reign on the earth when he makes it brand new. All right, 
So worship constitutes giving worth to the one who's created all things. Giving God his worth or worship, then, if we do not give God his worth, we will give worship to something else. This is an inescapable law of existence. We are physical, social beings. We are driven to find ob an object of worship or worship just as we are driven to food and companion, companionship. If we do not give God our worth, our worship, we will give it to others. Huh? We will give it uh, to ourselves, we will give it to others, and, and we will give it to things. Now let's explain that a little bit. Giving worth to self, all right? Worshiping ourselves, ascribing supreme worth to ourselves is a bad idea, attitude toward ourselves. It prevents us from being truly human as long as we play God. Huh? Because it is impossible to freely admit our failures on uh, one parades around in a flimsy masquerade putting up a ridiculous front to give illusion uh, to one's own self-worth. Why don't you move over here, then you can see. You want to bend around this here. Okay? Giving worth to others, all right? This attitude toward others can only dehumanize, degrade, and destroy both parties. Both parties. An attitude of worshiping a person may give him such powers that he is corrupted by it. Hitler, who did I say? Hitler is a prime example. He was destroyed by the wrong attitude of those who put him in power. He was literally worshipped and the uh, he was literally worshipped and the uh, and the atrocities I knew it was in there somewhere and the atrocities which marked his career illustrate what can happen to a man who is worshipped and gains the God complex. Are there are the David Koresh types, you know him, Jim Jones types from San Francisco, and then there are the Marshall White, uh, Apple White. David Koresh, a former Seventh-day Adventist, got the God, God complex, took a bunch of people down to Texas. What part of Texas? Waco, Texas and defied the government, and eventually came to the conclusion that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And he burned up. You remember, it's been on television. Then there's Jim Jones from San Francisco. Had a big church up there. Jim Jones said he's going to create a heaven on earth. So he took his flock who believed in him, who worshipped him, and took them down to Guyana. There in Guyana, he came to the, po to the point in the process of time uh, that they had to depart this world. So he had all of his people drink cyanide. What does that do to you? <laughs> it takes you out. It takes you out. And thus, he and his flock died there in the heat of Guyana. And then there's this fellow, Marshall Applewhite. You heard of him when the comet Haley Bob was coming around and they said it was going to come close to this earth a couple million miles away. He convinced his people who were following him, believing in him, that they were going to be picked up by that comet. Newsweek picked it up and that's rather recent. And he had them all drink some poison and put on Nike shoes tennis shoes, so that they would be ready to enter the spaceship. Delusion. To give worship to things. Huh? Devotion to materialism is a false worship of meaninglessness. 
Jesus said, what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall he give in exchange for his soul? Huh? Rockefeller, there in the uh, corner, was the governor of New York. He was a very rich man, came from a rich family, and he had great art. He collected from around the world. Oh, he was so proud of his art. But he's gone now. He's dead. He had worshipped material things. Sammy Davis Jr. And who's this other fella here? Michael Jackson. You know where they are. Six feet under because they gave their lives over to worship of materialism. Show business. And then uh, this fella here, uh oh, go back, go back, don't get so excited. Uh, this one here, Elvis Presley, also got caught up in that. And Frank Sinatra, also, Mr. Blue Eyes, yes. They all got caught up in this materialism, what the world has to offer. What have they gained? Nothing. Nothing but a grave. The reward then of false worship. The reward, go to Romans, the first chap chapter, if you will, please. Romans, the first chapter. I'm going to read uh, there some statements that brings us right down to today. Today. Romans 1, verses 18 and following. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. All right, are you there? Verse 19, Romans 1, verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, are you there? So that they are what? They're without excuse. You know, people say, well, there's no God. Beloved, they're without excuse. He has revealed himself, be verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorrupted uncorruptible God unto a, an image made in the made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God did what? He delivered them up. He, he gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to the dishonor of their own bodies between themselves. Now notice where we are, beloved. God gives them up. They didn't want God in their minds, in their hearts. So God gave them up. He said, okay, I won't force myself on you. So God gave them up. Now notice what happened. Notice what happens. Verse 26. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of women burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. Do you see where we are, beloved? In the stream of time, it's almost over. And thus, beloved, we need to make up our minds which way are we going to go. Amen? Now, beloved, Micah 6, 8, you see it there on the board. On screen, Micah 6, 8 uh, says, I have shown thee, O man, what I want you to do. I have shown thee. So God says you're without, uh, without excuse. Now, now look, let's look a moment at creature worship. Psalms 8, are you there? Go to Psalms, the 8th chapter. That's in the middle of the Old Testament. Psalms, the 8th division. That's what they actually are, divisions. Psalm, the 8th chapter, 8th division. And now don't notice, we're looking at verse 4 through 8. Psalm 8, verses 4 through 8. 
Are you there? All right, let's read. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have, what's the word? Dominion over the works of thy hands. Now he's just described his works, and he said, I've put man over them. So man was the first king. Only kings have dominion. If they were to rule the animals, and the animals were to have respect to, the, to, the, to man. Thou madest him to give, to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of, of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. God has put man in charge or over them. Now, what a pity. Man turns around, and instead of being over them, man stoops to the level of worshiping them. The end to which man's create creature worship behavior leads is idolatry of the worst kind. It's the worst kind because God puts man over the animal, but yet man stoops down in the dirt to worship that animal. What foolishness could be greater than the worship an animal instead of God? The God of heaven who created the animals. The primary idea of this psalm is the love and goodness of God towards man and man's lofty position, his exalted destiny, for he is the crown jewel of God's creation. Man is the crown jewel of the God's creation. He's given dominion, rulership over them, and yet he will sit down, down. This is what sin has done. It has changed the molecular structure of our minds, and now instead of ruling over them, we worship them. Sin has done a terrible thing. If any man worship the beast. Now notice, beloved, God calls the false worship that we're going to get into now a beast. Man is to rule the beasts, and yet man is worshiping the beast. Go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. I want you to notice Revelation 13, starting at verse 1. Now, this may read kind of strange to some of you who've not been into the prophecies of Daniel and, and Revelation, but I will briefly, briefly run through them. Now, notice what it says, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, notice, and the feet were as the feet of a bear. Ever seen one like that? And his mouth was the mouth of a lion. Ever see that? And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. If you will notice, Daniel, or Daniel describes these beasts, but in four separate categories because they represent four different nations. There's the lion, there's the bear, there's the leopard, there's the nondescript beast. Daniel 7 has these beasts in number, and then oh, the, the fourth beast was transformed into uh, what we understand to be the papacy, or the little horn power. You'll notice it there in the middle. That little horn came up among the ten. The ten were ten nations of Western Europe. And they're all over here now into the New Testament, a composite of all of them. Now notice who all of them represents. The lion represented uh, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, 
and then Rome and the papacy. They were beasts. And so now these beasts, their characteristics, are all found again in the New Testament. And this beast is then worshipped. Notice the Bible. I'm reading verse 3 of chapter three, uh, of 13. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world, tell me something, what does the rest of it say? All the world, what? Wondered. After who? The beast. That's all the world, except for those whose names are written in the book of life. The book of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Daniel brings us up to date in the book of Revelation that we're talking about a beast, or the beast representing nations, peoples, multitudes, just as these nations here were representing nations, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. They're all here. There's the body of a leopard. There's the mouth of a lion. Notice the bear, the feet of a bear. They're all here in this composite or in the makeup, and it has ten horns. And, and uh, the Bible then tells us, verse 4, chapter 13, Revelation 13, 4, and they, what's the word? Worship. And they worshipped the dragon. They didn't realize it, but they are worshipping the dragon. Who's the dragon? The devil. They worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the, unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking what? Great things, Great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months, 1260 days. Now notice, we're going to define now. We're not trying to be hurtful to anybody. But beloved, here's what we have found over years from the Reformation time, back in the 16th century, to, to today. Defining the beast. Regarding this title, the Catholic Journal, Our Sunday Visitor. Excuse me. Let's go back. Did it go back? Okay. Okay. Our Sunday Visitor, which is a Catholic paper, of April 18, 1915, reported in answer to a question, what are the letters supposed to be in the Pope's crown, and what do they signify, if anything? The letters you refer to are these, vicarious filii dei. There it is, vicarious filii dei. Dei, the numerical value, these are Roman numerals, the numerical value here, vicarious, 112, filiae, fi, uh, filiae, filiae, vicarious, filiae, dei, 53 and 501. Added up, comes out to 666. Notice this. The letters you refer to are these, vicarious, filiae, dei, which in the Latin are vicar, of the Son of God. That's what it means, vicar in place of. Catholics hold that the church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Quickly turn back to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. 2 Thessalonians, are you there? 2 Thessalonians Philippians, Colossians, and 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and I'm reading, reading there at verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that would be the second coming of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away, a falling away from the truth. First, and that man of sin, the, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now notice who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what? That he is God. 
That sounds awfully familiar. Amen? All right, then he would speak great things. I want you to notice this statement taken September 12, 2013. When was that? Last year. Now notice, it, the Pope clear is clear, clear conscience trumps faith. Here's what the Pope said. It is not belief in God that counts, but abiding by one's conscience that determines who gets to heaven. Pope Francis tells atheists in a letter written to the Italian newspaper La Repubblica responding to a query about whether God forgives those who do, don't, who do not seek the faith. He said, it's not belief in God. It's not belief in God that counts. So will God forgive those who do, don't seek the faith? Hebrews 11 will answer it. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Are you there? Hebrews 11. I'm reading it, verse 6. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that... What does it say, beloved? Diligently seek him. I'm not going to ask you who's right. I think it's obvious. We read in Revelation 13 that the beast would receive a deadly wound. General Berthier of Napoleon's army informs the Pope that he is no longer to hold office of any kind, stripped of all authority, Pope Pius VI died in captivity seven months later. This took place 1798. But lo and behold, it says, we read in Revelation 13, his deadly wound was what? Healed. Deadly wound healed. The Lateran Treaty is one of the Lateran Pacts of 1929 of Lateran Accords. Three agreements made in 1929 between the Kingdom of Italy and the Holy See. The Holy See is the seat where the Pope sits. Ratified June 7, 1929, ending the Roman question. The agreements included a political treaty which created the state of the Vatican City and guaranteed full and independent sovereignty of the Holy See. In other words, within the, the country, the state of Italy, the country of Italy, is another country or is another state. And that other state is, is where the Holy, is called the Holy See. Okay? The Holy See, where the bishop, or where the Bishop of Rome stays. In other words, it's another city that we have, you must give recognition to. That's why in Washington, D.C., we have a, what, an ambassador from the Vatican. Not Italy. Italy has its own ambassador. But the Vatican is being considered another state that we give recognition to, to the world give recognition to, and they send ambassadors to represent them. We have one in Washington, D.C., Worship of, of his image. An image is a likeness. And in Revelation 13, 15 through 18, let's consider the words there. Revelation 13 through 15. Notice what it says. 15 through 18. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship. What's the word again? Worship the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. That's a terrible thing to think of. Well, that's what the Bible says. Now, we either trust what the Bible says or we have our own conclusions to draw. 
The beast and the image are united in their aims and policies and in, in their demand that man receive the mark of the beast. Therefore, one who worships the beast also worships the image and is the bearer of his mark. Now, beloved, I'm going to jump quickly. Go to the 10th verse. Or No, no, no. Verse 11. Chapter 13, verse 11, Revelation. I beheld another beast. Notice, this is a second beast now, and most commentaries today, from the Reformation time to today, recognize this as the United States. The second beast is the United States. I beheld, notice, another beast coming up out of the earth. The, the beast that we saw previously, they came up out of the sea. The waters represent many peoples. No, let me tell you, let me show you where that says that. Revelation 17, 15, 17, 15, these shall make war. No, wait a minute. Verse 15, and he that saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, that's again the name given to false religions, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So water in prophecy represents people, nations, and tongues. Now, but this beast comes up out of the earth, representing a desolate, uh, a not heavily populated area, and that's how America started. But it says this beast, notice verse 11, 13, 11, 13, 11, I beheld another beast come up out of the earth, and he had two horns, civil and religious liberty, that's what we have in America. He had two horns, like a lamb, oh yes, but he what? Spake as a dragon. Now how does a, a nation speak? He spake as a dragon. A nation speaks through its laws or legislative body. Let me show you somebody making noise. In the summer of 1998, July 5th, Pope John Paul II issued a lengthy apostolic letter, Dies Domini, in which he urged people not only to start keeping what day? Sunday, holy, but, but to pass laws, to pass what? Laws that will enforce it. Now your Bible says that and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now that image has not been completely erected as yet. That the image of the beast should both speak, speak, make laws to enforce it, should, be, should, should, should speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Should be killed. Now notice, beloved, I want to try and put this together. Pope John Paul confronts the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Holocaust, and other horrors in seeking to express regret for sins committed by who? In the past 2,000 years. Now notice this statement. An apology in the March issue of... Uh, March 20, 2000, issue of Time Magazine, page 23, Pope John Paul apologized to the world for the horrors committed by the Roman Church. Oh, it seems like the Bible's up, up to date. Now notice, the mark of the beast then, what is his mark? Our mark of authority the church of Rome is above the Bible, number one. And the transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. That's what we're confronted with, see? So what I'm saying, beloved, the Bible indicates that there's coming a time when America will adopt these procedures and these practices and with force upon those who will not obey the laws. 
So now, Acts 5, 29. We ought to obey God rather than man. Notice again, September 17, 2007. Pope says, Sunday worship, a necessity, a necessity for all. Come down to the last statement. Notice, Pope Benedict the 16th says, your life depends upon worshiping on, on Sunday. Beloved, we're close. We're close. Now, when I say we're close, I don't mean tomorrow. You know, but I'm, I, it's close. You see, God is not confined by time. A day is how long with God? A thousand years. It's like a thousand. In other words, we're time creatures. You know, we're, it's 10 after 12. Some of you are blinking. You can't, you can't hold your head up, you know. But if I take you to the show, you'll sit there for three hours and never blink an eye. That's off my subject. <laughs> But you see my point? God is not confined to time. And look how long it has taken for, for the world to come to this point. But we need to be ready whenever. huh? Now notice. Let me go back a few years. In the year 325, Sylvester Bishop of Rome uh, officially changed the title of the first day, calling it what? The Lord's Day. You wonder where that came from. Now, I'm, notice where I'm reading from, the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Notice the, the question, what is the Sabbath day? Now this is from their book. This is what they teach their children, as well as adults. Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. And people ask, well, don't they know? Don't they know the difference? Yes, they know the difference. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday, because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea 336 transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. We need to ask ourselves, are they, can they do that? Huh? When the mark of the beast is given. Now note this, this beloved, because I don't want you running out here, pointing out people and say, you got the mark, let me see. Is it? See, the mark of the beast is a set of mind, who you believe. Huh? Now notice, it is not until the issue is plainly set before the people and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men, Sabbath versus Sunday, that those who continue in transgression will, will receive the mark of the beast. Huh? So God has not put a time limit on this but there are certain signs that tell you how close we are to this. And we are close. And God is going to pour out the wrath of God without mixture. We read that, Revelation 13. Without mixture. Now what does that mean? Well, we go to Isaiah 28, 21. When David had been anointed king, then the Philistines surrounded him. They're going to take him out. See? Philistine has some giants. They're going to take him out. The Philistines came up against him, but were destroyed by God at Pirazim and Gibeon. You find that story in 1 Chronicles 14, 8 through 16. As, ha as the Lord had manifested himself in overwhelming David's enemies... So he will subdue the enemies of God's church in the last days. And this without mercy. It's a strange act. Let me read Isaiah 28. Go to Isaiah 28, verse 21. Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, verse 21. For the Lord will rise up in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth, mad, as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his, his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. 
Beloved, when the God of heaven pours out his wrath on the world, people were saying, well, Lord, why? Huh. The reason why is because they didn't want him in their life in the, in the beginning. They put him off. You read Noah's story. They didn't want to get in Noah's boat, but when the water reached right up here, <laughs> you know, you know, and then when it started going over the nose, they said, we, now we believe. <laughs> now we believe. But it was too late. Noah couldn't open the door of the boat to let him in. He didn't close it. An angel closed it. So God is not going to be able to save those who at the last say, oh, well, I don't want, they see the fire coming and they say, I don't want the, the, that wrath of God. Too late. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Some people say, you see there, we're going to burn forever. It's not saying that. Go over here to Jude 1. Are you there? It's right in front of the book of Revelation. It's the book, it's the one chapter book. It's in front of Revelation. Hurry, hurry, don't slow me, slow me down. Don't slow me down. Notice what it says, Jude 1, 6 and 7. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal fire. But I ask you the question, are they burning today? No, they're not. But it's eternal, because it, when it starts to burn, beloved, it'll burn till there's nothing else to burn. That's what it means. Eternal life given only to the righteous and obedient, Romans 5, 19. In order for the wicked to burn forever, they must live forever. And to live forever is only promised to the righteous. They must exist forever, to burn forever. Well, they burn till there's nothing else to burn. And the smoke ascendeth up. So we have come down to the, to the last days. And what's going to happen in the last days is what happened in the early days of the earth. Two boys had a fight. What were they arguing over? Their worship. God had instructed their parents, Noah, and Adam and Eve. Excuse me, I got my Bible mixed up. God had instructed them that when you come to worship me, you bring a lamb. Abel had a different idea. In defiance to God, he brought the fruit of the ground. He said, this is good enough for you. At least I'm worshiping. You know, people have said that to me. At least I'm worshiping. But who is to, who is to, 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 to lead whom? Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Who is to agree with whom? Is God to agree with me? Look at the multitude. Look at the majority. Is God to agree with them? Or are they to agree with God? They're to agree with God. He made them. Huh? And so as we've seen in the Bible, beloved, there's going to come a time we're all in the same house. God has taught the people what is right. He has showed them if you do right, you're going to be hated by those who do wrong. Second, uh, uh, Second Corinthians 3.12, or 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.12, all those who live godly shall suffer persecution. Now, beloved, let's take a brief look at church history. Judaism started with Christ. The apostles led and developed the Christian church. Out of the Christian church came men with another idea, and that developed into the Roman Catholic Church. 
based on the traditions of men. Out of that came the Greek Orthodox Church. Then in 1517, there was a Reformation. The Reformation went back to the Bible. And on sola scriptura, the Bible alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola Christo, Christ alone, sola fide, faith alone. Out of that discussion, as well as struggle, came the leading churches of the world today, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Baptist, and so, so forth. Out of these major churches of the world, which eventually, according to the book of Revelation, will go back, will go back into two, that which they came out of because of the linkage. Notice the linkage. The linkage between these Protestant churches and the church of Rome is Sunday keeping. And they will go back into, according to the book of Revelation, except those who believe and study the word of God. Thus, beloved, God's last day church, many of them will come out because God is calling them out. And the Seventh-day Adventist church, as closely as possible, are following the word. They're not a perfect people, but we have a perfect God. Amen. So you're going to, if you examine us closely, you'll see all of our flaws. But one look at all flaws, ten looks at the Savior. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Help me, church. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. 1840, Revelation uh, 18.4 God is calling a people out. What a pity. Now notice this was written by a Baptist. Notice the Baptist church manual written, written by Hiscox. What a pity that his Sunday comes branded with the mark of paganism and christened with the name of the Son God when adopted and sanctioned by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. What a pity! But all will not accept that. That's the religion of man. And man tried to make it to heaven in Babel, but he will not make it either in this last day. And so, beloved, if it is in your heart to follow God's way, to do God's commandments, to be found faithful to Him, I'm going to invite you just to stand as a testimony. You won't embarrass me if you don't want to stand. But if you want to stand and say, Lord, I accept your way. Heavenly Father, here are your people. Here are your children. They have stood because of their conviction that you're right. May that conviction abide within our hearts and grow, not only for time, but for eternity. That finally at last we may look upon thy face and hear from thy lips that final benediction. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in little. I will make you ruler over much. May Jesus bless you and keep you. Shall we meet again? In Jesus' name.